Hello everyone. No, it's been a while since I've done one of these chats. And it seems I'm out of practice on everything that needs to be up. Because I forgot to bring up my chat. So I'm bringing up the chat right now. Half the reason I like to do these things is to basically interact with all of you out there. Those of you nerds who, well, tune in to hear about the French horn and obscure topics surrounding the French horn. There we go. So chat is open. And I'm sort of stalling a bit to just allow some people to get into the stream. I did not have the the countdown screen loaded up, which is how we norm how I normally wait for people to get into the chat. Um, so how have you all been today? I've been I've been doing pretty well these last few weeks. I've been out of town a lot, traveling a lot, playing a lot. And I'm always grateful for that. I do understand that it is a privilege to be able to make a living as a musician. And I always think about how thankful I am to be able to do that every day. Um, but today we're here to talk about some more um, topics surrounding looking for a horn. And this is regarding the spec sheet. Most manufacturer and retailer sites, including ours, will tend to have a spec sheet along with their French horns. Um, the goal is basically to provide as much information as possible about the instrument to help you make a decision, especially if you don't have the ability to fly to Fort Worth, Texas, you know, to try out to try out your French horns. Um, for those of you who don't know, our, our shop is located in Fort Worth, Texas. Um, 20 minutes from the airport, close by to the airport, so easy to get to, but still not everyone has the time or extra money to be able to fly out and try a bunch of horns. So we try to put as much information as possible out on the web to help you make a decision. However, I, I'll be frank, a lot of the specs that are listed can be ignored. And there are some that you should pay attention to, but for the most part, they don't. Um, some should be paid attention to, but many of them are really irrelevant and you really have to just play the instrument because the spec that you're seeing doesn't tell you anything about how the instrument plays or what you should be doing with it. Um, hello, um, Swift Bullet. Um, the three horns we're going to compare the spec sheets for today are the Rico Kuhn 293 Innovation. Those of you who have seen the stream before know that this is one of um, my favorite horns that we sell. In fact, I now play the Rico Kuhn Innovation as my primary horn. Um, I still own my Madeline, but and I'll make a detailed video about this, but everyone that I've played my Metlin for compared to the Rico Kuhn Innovation has liked the Innovation better. And that includes um, other people at the shop. That includes um, some mentors and people I really trust and some very prominent players in Texas. I've taken the opportunity to play my Metlin for them and play the Rico Kuhn Innovation for them. And no one has said that they liked the Medlin better than my innovation as far as the sound that I produce on the two horns. So I just took that as a sign that I should probably be playing uh, the Rico Kuhn innovation. Now, this is if you've seen my first video about the innovation, this is not the this is not the first innovation I received. Um, I ended up having uh, Rico Kuhn make another one, and I had some things um, changed about it. Um, but again, I'll talk about that in a longer video about not choosing a French horn for yourself. 
but we're going to be looking at the spec sheet and hearing the Rico Kuhn innovation. We are going to be looking at the spec sheet and comparing that to the sound of the Lewis Dirk ODX5 Rhenish that we sell. And we are going to be listening to and comparing that to the Yamaha 871. Um, the Yamaha 871, made in Japan, it is Yamaha's uh, custom horn. Uh, it was released at, at NAM in 2018. And it's gotten a lot of attention ever since. It's been one of our uh, better selling in horns in the shop. It's now over $8,000. It was about $7,000, but the prices of all of the horns have been going up rapidly. In fact, a year ago, when someone would come in, high school, senior, college, freshman, and say, hey, I need a horn for college, uh, I would say you need to look from four to $6,000. Um, these days, that doesn't buy you a whole lot. And I tell people you have to be looking like five to eight now. Um, but such is the world that we live in. And I guess I should have said a little bit more about the LDX-5. Lewis Dirk LDX-5, uh, manufactured by Dietmar Dirk with the lead pipe made by Steve Lewis in Chicago. Um, but the horn is basically manufactured in, in Germany. Um, marketed towards an American market with its sound and, and the feel of the horn. Um, one of the uh, one of our workers at the shop plays an LDX five and loves her and, and loves it. Okay, so the first one we're gonna we're gonna try is the Rico Kuhn innovation. So first we'll look at the spec sheet, and then we'll uh, listen to the sound. So the spec sheet is here. Let me so here we go um, I'm hoping you're all seeing this on your screens um, in the spec sheet we have compact design similar to our X models um, compact it's one of those really relative terms compact compared to what uh, in this case, I'm sure Rico Kuhn is comparing it to traditional Geyer style horns, which tend to have a large wrap. Um, so it is compact compared to those horns. It is not compact. The The circle, the, the wrap is not. Let me do my picture in picture here. Is that working? Nope. There we go. Um, what I'm talking about is the size of the circle. That's when they're talking about compact design. And it's not compact compared to a CRISPR style horn or an Alex 103, um, et cetera. It, it is compact compared to, like, for example, um, my Madeline, which is a big circle. And guyers have a big circle because they need that in order to feel ergonomically comfortable. You can tell sometimes on some guyer style horns where they try to make the circle too small. Normally, be, Normally, to get it to fit in many cases, because a big Geyer style horn doesn't fit in a lot of cases. Um, but those guy wrap horns with wraps that are too small tend to get really awkward ergonomically. Um, so, compact design. All crooks, handmade, hand hammered, and fit perfectly. So, this one is. You might think that that one is not important. That one actually is important. Uh, most manufacturers don't disclose that information, but what Rico Kuhn is trying to say here is that the crooks are bent in a traditional way. So the, the crooks are filled with pitch, which is this very black, thick liquid. Um, the pitch hardens, and then the pipe is bent. The pitch prevents the pipe from collapsing during the bend. Um, however, even if you fill it with pitch, some um, ripples will appear around the um, around the bend, and then those ripples have to be 
worked out with uh, a burnishing tool in order to make it smooth. What that process does is it ends up work hardening the metal um, more than the other process I'm going to mention in a moment here. Uh, and a lot of people believe, and, and, and myself included, because I have noticed the difference that uh, the metal is ringier and it sounds better because it's, it's harder. It's, um, it transmits energy a bit more efficiently. Um, some manufacturers, especially large manufacturers, um, blow a lot of the, um, the crooks in the bins. So that basically involves taking the brass pipe, putting it into an alum, uh, roughly bending it, um, putting the roughly bent part into an aluminum cast, and then um, forcing hydraulic fluid through the pipe to, so that the pipe takes the shape of the aluminum casts, you know, due to the pressure of the hydraulic fluid. Um, the advantage of that method is that it produces perfectly bent parts every single time. As long as your, um, as long as your aluminum mold is correct, and you probably spent thousands and thousands of dollars on it, so it is correct, um, you'll get a perfectly bent part. But it, um, ends up in a huge reduction in the amount of work hardening because there are no ripples or anything that you need to really work out of the metal. So that metal ends up being softer. Um, going on down here, traditionally um, made leap pipe. Um, I actually don't know what, what is being referred to there. Um, lightweight construction, ultra thin slides. So this um, and the Ricochet innovation is lightweight, but again, if you see lightweight on a description, it's all relative. There are horns that are much heavier than the coon that would say lightweight. There are horns much lighter than the coon that would say lightweight. Um, I kind of wish manufacturers would just put up the weight of the instrument, but you'll basically never see that. If you actually compare the actual weights of the instruments to each other, that would be a more useful um, designation than just lightweight. Um, now here's one that on most horns is unimportant, but on this one it is, and that's the bore size. So let's talk about bore size. And why is it important in this listing? And why is it not important, like say in this 871 listing? In the Kuhn listing, what the numbers of the bores are don't matter. But what we see here is that there is a different bore on the B flat side of the horn than on the F side of the horn. So this is a dual bore horn. Um, another a very prominent, famous dual bore horn is the Paxman um, 25. Um, my desk hat, the Paxman 45 is also dual bore. In Paxman's naming system, if the model number ends with a five, it is a dual bore uh, instrument. But the um, dual bore basically means the size of the F side is expanded so that the resistance on the F side of the horn more matches the B flat side of the horn. And what you'll notice on a dual bore horn is that um, there is less of a change, less of a shift between the B flat and the F sides of the horn. So saying all that, aside from the fact that the Yamaha 871 is not dual bore, what that actual bore size is doesn't matter. And a lot of people really spend too much time focused on what the bore size is. Number one, what the bore size is, is the size of the cylindrical tubing. On a lot of horn forums and discussions and things like that, people misuse the word bore when they mean bell size. Like for example, when you'll hear people call a Con 8D a large bore horn. And I cringe every time I hear that because the Con 8D is in no way, shape or form a large bore horn. It, it's on the smaller side of bores. It is a large bell horn. 
it's a large horn as in it produces a large um, diffuse velvety sound but it is not a large boar horn and normally I don't like to get pedantic it's, you could just say like oh they're talking they're you know anytime someone says boar they mean bell but that's not the case the boar size is something that ref is a measurement that refers to something on the horn and it can get really confusing when people say I want a large boar horn when they actually want a large bell horn now boar sizes or with some exceptions as you, um, it's usually 11.9 millimeters or um, 0.468 inches 12 millimeters or 0.472 inches or 12.1 millimeters or 0.476 inches and in general, the larger the bore is, the more free blowing it is. However, the bore is just one tiny component that determines how free blowing or restrictive a horn is. Manufacturers will choose the bore size that complements the design of their horn so that the resistance is where it feels just right. But you can't take a horn from one manufacturer with a 12.1 bore and a horn from another manufacturer with an 11.9 bore and then say, well, the one with the 12.1 bore is gonna be more free blowing. So I, I need to look at that and find a horn with a 12.1 bore so that it's more free blowing. That's not the case at all. That 11.9 bore horn could be far more free blowing than that 12.1 bore horn because it's only one of many factors that determines the blow of the horn. And that's what I mean when I say the bore size is irrelevant because it doesn't tell you anything useful. The only other exception, I, the only exception I can think of is, I, and I'm not super familiar with his horns, but I know Carl, Hill, Carl Hill's Cortes Maki horns come in a large bore and a small bore version. And since it's the same horn, the exact same horn from the exact from the same manufacturer in a large and small bore version, that actually you can actually feel the difference that just changing the bore itself makes. But as far as I know, please correct me in the chat if I'm missing anybody, there isn't a manufacturer out there that makes the same horn in different bores so that you can actually in such a way that the difference in bore size matters a another example of this here is i compare that 871 to the yamaha 671 here the 671 has a 12 millimeter slash 0.472 bore while this 871 12.1 millimeter slash 0.476 bore but if you've actually played the 871 compared to the 671, it's not more free blowing. The, the blow is the same on each instrument. And that's because the lead pipe is different on each instrument. Um, and and basically it comes it becomes a wash. Both horns have about the same amount of resistance. Okay, so. Going back to the Kuhn listing, lightweight valves as known from our triples. Um, that kind of goes along with lightweight horn. Like what, what is lightweight? Lightweight compared to what? It would make, it would be giving more information if the, if it mentioned how the valves were lightweight. Um, sometimes valves can be made lightweight by just reducing the diameter of the valves. So um, yeah, these valves are made from Meinl Schmidt, like many uh, custom makers horns. And if you order a valve section from Meinl Schmidt, as, as our shop has done in the past, there are different sizes, different physical sizes of rotors that you can buy. And um, the lighter weight rotors will result in the horns easier to play with a bit more color in the sound while the larger rotors tend to add a bit more of a veil, um, a bit more of a veil to the sound. Um, 
So you, it can be lightweight. It can be a lightweight rotor just by having a smaller rotor. Some uh, manufacturers will actually take the rotor and they will drill holes into the rotor in places that don't matter as far as um, sealing the air in. But um, weight will just physically be removed from the valve from the rotors by um, drilling out metal from the rotors. Um, sometimes rotors can be lightweight because they're hollow. Uh, and we can actually see that on the Yamaha 871 spec sheet again, where we see valve rotors solid, fourth rotor hollow. So they're making that fourth rotor hollow to, um, to reduce the weight of the entire um, valve section a bit. Um, and of course, Finca um, reduces the weight by making his valves out of a composite material entirely instead of making the valves out of brass. Um, and if you're familiar, uh, Paxman doesn't make these valve sections anymore, but a lot of earlier uh, Paxman valves, including uh, my first truly professional horn, which was a Paxman uh, 25L, um, has titanium valves. And titanium is lighter weight than brass, but... Um, they're out of production because titanium is um, really hard to machine and just not cost effective. So, and then light levers and linkages, of which, you know, compared to what, although on the innovation I do know, you know since I do play one, um, that he's actually physically modifying the levers and the linkages on the horn to make them more lightweight. So now that we're pretty far into the stream, I'm gonna play um, a little bit. I'm gonna compare, I'm gonna play the Rico Kuhn, and then I'm going to play the LDX-5, and I'm gonna play the 871, and then we'll talk a little bit more about specs in a moment. This is the LDX-5.
All right, so we heard clear differences between all of the horns. From my ear, listening to myself, I felt that the rear cocoon had more of a sweeter, um, more open and lighter sound. The LDX-5 was a little more gutsy with a um, slightly brighter sound. And the uh, 871 had a, a darker sound, um, a, just a bit, um, a bit more, a bit more broad feeling. So, going back to the spec sheet, should have turned the camera to this, but anyway, here we go. You saw me in the little in the little corner off on the screen. Going to the Lewis Dirk, let's see if there are any, um, any specs that we didn't see. So we have B flat F, easily reversible. It's nice that they mentioned that it's easily reversible. However, every modern, you can reverse the way basically any modern horn stands. I don't know of one horn that you can't change from standing in B-flat to changing back in F, whether it's a um, low-level cheaper horn or a premium horn. It's, it's just something that uh, manufacturers do these days. Pitch, A440 up to 443 um, possible. Um, I don't really know what we're trying to say with this one. Um, this changes from um, horn to horn that actually lists the spec. You'll notice Rico Kuhn, um, Rico Kuhn does not list any sort of spec as far as um, um, the pitch of the horn. And neither does the 871 just because it's um, pretty much expected and you can assume that any horn will play in 440 up to 443 slash 445 because in america most orchestras play 440 with some playing 441 442 and europe it's going to be 442 sometimes higher but i any horn is generally made to fit within that spectrum so not something to really worry about bore 12.1 um 476 um, so this ldx5 has the exact same bore as the 871 uh, so, the, but the LDX-5, when I was just playing it, was far more resistant. And the 871 felt like a bigger, broader horn. And you might think, well, the, Derek, that one had the 12.1 millimeter bore. That's why it felt bigger and broader. Why didn't the LDX-5 feel bigger and broader with the exact same bore? Valves, solid conical valves with um, tapered spindles. This one is nice to know. Uh, some manufacturers do use cylindrical valves, um, but it's up, it's up to a fierce debate as to whether that affects the longevity or the playability of the valves. But it's something that's nice to know if you're far enough into like horn building and horn facts that you'd like to know that it's a conical valve uh, with a tapered spin spindle. But that describes the vast majority of valves, especially since LDX-5 uses Meinl Schmidt valves. So they're just describing Meinl Schmidt valves there. Um, lever action, string action. Now this one is really important. It's actually one of the reasons I did not continue to play the first innovation that I was sent and asked for another one because the first innovation had mechanical linkages. And after... A week or two of playing with mechanical linkages, I really came to hate mechanical linkages. There was nothing wrong with the mechanical linkages. They were quiet, they were smooth, they were fast. But to my perception, like there's like a little bump, a, just a tiny click at the beginning of starting um, of starting the valve movement when you're pressing it down. And it just, for me, I'm not saying it would annoy everyone, considering most of the world uses mechanical linkage. String linkage is really an American thing. Um, it 
it really annoyed me. And like I I I I need sports string linkage for myself. Um so that's really important. Changing valve with mini ball, yes, most um, most thumb linkages, even though some some thumb linkages are string, most are going to be mechanical. Just it's just easier to do that way, um, and sometimes results in better action than trying to put a string linkage on the change valve. Um, water key standard on lead pipe. That's good to know. You want to know how many water keys are on there? Generally, most horns will have one, but sometimes they'll sometimes they'll come with two, and sometimes they come with zero. But yeah, most people will at least want one. Cylindrical crooks perfect cylindrical calibration i don't know what that means i i guess they're just saying that the horn is put together well and that there's nothing you know there are no oval shaped um oval shaped tubes in there kind of stuffed into ferrules and some of the uglier things you see on cheaper horns on a horn as expensive as the ldx5 that um Assuming that the horn is well built is a given. Slides, hand lapped inner and outer slides are made of nickel silver. So this is really getting into the weeds here, but most slides are made out of nickel silver because nickel silver is harder and will last longer. If your slides, uh, and I know there are some sound advantages to having yellow brass slides. If your slides are yellow brass, that's a softer metal, they're gonna wear quicker. Your valves, your slides are going to be falling out of your horn faster than you might like, and you might have to take it to a, a repair shop to get those slides tightened. Especially if you don't um, grease your slides um, often and you allow them to dry out. Uh, but most slides are made out of nickel silver for for that reason. But it's good to know in case in case you care and you want an all yellow brass horn or you see that the slide is made out of yellow brass and you're like, well, this isn't gonna last very long. Um, braces made from the best solid nickel silver rods available. I wonder what that is. Well, I wonder what the best nickel silver rods available are. Um, bell diameter, uh, 310 millimeters. Uh, this is kind of, you'll notice most manufacturers don't mention bell diameter and I'm not saying that it doesn't matter. Um, I have an old 1952 Geyer that has a very large bell diameter, much larger than 310 millimeters. But it, and it's one of the pieces in a larger puzzle as to how a horn plays. But by itself, that that measurement doesn't really tell you anything. Detachable bell standard, you know, just it's good to know you don't have to pay extra for for the detachable bell on this one. Um, bell ring, special bronze for long life and durability. Um, bronze is a very hard metal, like nickel, silver. So again, sometimes you'll see, yeah, well, I've seen on cheaper horns and maybe on some expensive horns, but I haven't noticed it, that the rings are made of yellow brass. Yellow brass will have the same problem. It will wear fast. So most rings are made out of nickel, silver, as you would see on, um, this Rico Kuhn here, it's a nickel silver ring. The Yamaha 871 is also a nickel silver ring. And the LDX5 is a bronze ring. So just in general, you, you'd want your you would want your horn to um, have a bell ring made out of nickel, silver, or bronze. Single seam bell tail with a fused spun bell flare. Medium sized bell throat like that of a traditional Geyer style horn. So, bell throat size. Uh, on our website and on still a lot of listings, we list the bell sizes either medium, medium large, or large but again that's a very subjective thing and actually I got into an argument with Dennis Houghton about this regarding um, one particular horn a few weeks ago because there was a horn that was listed on our website as a medium bell taper and um, I personally think of the horns with a bell tail the size of like a traditional Geyer like um, like you see on this listing of the LDX-5 as being a medium, 
of medium uh, as being a medium sized bell throat and flare. But uh, Dennis thought that size was medium large and that a true medium bell flare should be compared to a Paxman um, M bell flare. So, you know, they're 20 M or they're 25 M, which is quite small and much smaller than um, than a, a traditional Geyer horn or like this LDX-5. Um, and another comparison, uh, Rico Kuhn calls the bell flares on his 293 medium large. And it's really, it's about the same size as the LDX-5 and, and, and the Yamaha. So after that, um, we've just started removing that designation from our horns because it really is just totally subjective. You know, what's a medium bell flare to one person can be a medium large bell flare to another person. What's a large bell flare to another person can be an extra large bell flare to somebody else. Um, it, 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 it would be nice to, you know, if there was some sort of measurement that could actually be given for each of these horns so that it could be compared. However, the the bell tail and the bell flare is a complex curve. There's no way to give um, to give just an accurate measurement as to what that is. So we use subjective terms like medium or medium large. Single seam bell tail with fuse with a fuse spun bell flare. So um, the se amount of seams in the bell tail is just it starts off as a flat sheet of metal. So it's how many seams you have to put into that flat sheet of metal to make it into um, um, to make it into a cone. Um, that's you know. Again, it's not really like if you see something like that on a spec spec list, you can just pass it right by because it doesn't it doesn't really tell you much about the playability of the horn or anything like that. Optional finishes, lacquered, silver plated, gold plated. Yeah, you'd, you'd want to know what your options are there. Um, and other options, just pinky hook, hand rest, water key. Again, just list the options. Yeah, that's important to know if you want a special order horn and you want it built exactly as you want. Same thing with hand hammered options, hand hammered bell tail, hand hammered bell flare. Um, most instruments don't actually list whether it's a hand hammered or a spun bell flare. Because again, it's one of many options there. I would say though, any detachable, any horn with a detachable flare where you have the option of choosing a spun or a hand hammered flare, you should pay attention to that. Uh, Cause there is quite a big difference in sound and the, uh, constantly reproducible difference in sound a hand hammered it's hard to put into words though a hand hammered flare will have more of a rustic tone uh, while a spun bell flare has more of a um a, a bit of a drier more modern tone i find that spun bell flares actually project better into a hall so i personally tend to use spun bell flares but there are lots of professionals who would disagree and they really enjoy the rustic tone of the of the hand hammered bell flare so that that is an, an important thing to take note of does this horn have a hand hammered bell or is it a spun bell uh all horns priced without a case basically once you get above eight thousand dollars all horns don't have a case i know more expensive horn it would seem like you'd get more options with it but yeah, it's more of the hotel thing. If you've ever stayed in like a four or five star hotel, you find out that nothing is included. Staying in a five star hotel just means you have the option to purchase all of these extra amenities. So let's move a little faster here because I know we're getting um we're getting close to the end of the hour. By the way, if you have any questions about French horns or specs or different French horns at all, uh, please leave them in the chat and I will, I will get to them and I will answer them to the best of my ability. So 871, FB flat, yellow brass, medium. You know, it's important to know whether the bell is fixed or detachable, etc. cetera. Um, again, Bell size medium. Um, 
There are some people who'd say bell size medium large. Um, Dennis, but not, I would agree with the medium designation. Um, bore size 12.1. We've gone into why I don't think that's a great, um, a great measurement. Number of valves four. So you'll see this on any manufacturer's website where they're um, selling to um, younger students and the parents of younger students. I can't tell you how many people I've had come into the shop and they say like, I need a horn with four valves. And hey, if someone says I need a horn with four valves, like we know what they mean. Though not the most accurate thing to send your student off looking for because Technically, if they're not going to a trusted shop like ours or they're just trying to buy off of eBay or Craigslist or Facebook Marketplace, um, a single B-flat horn with a stopping valve will have, yeah, will have four valves. A compensating double horn will have four valves. A double descant horn that doesn't have a stopping valve will have four valves. Um, so you can find your students bringing back all sorts of weird things with only the designation by a horn with four valves. We've already talked about valve rotors with solid, you know, fourth rotor hollow. We've talked about lever action finish. We talked about lacquer. So we haven't actually talked about that. So for the most part for horn players, you can, you get your horn either raw brass or lacquered. Lacquered horns are shiny. They will stay shiny until the lacquer comes off and then um, lacquered horns tend to look really ugly as the lacquer starts to flake off and pitting happens because the sweat and acid from your hands gets into the spots where the lacquer has worn but only um, the spots where the lacquer has worn um, and thus the surface of the instrument gets kind of um, not pleasant but um, you'll have a shiny horn and it will stay shiny for those who uh, that's important to. Um, raw brass will tarnish very quickly. So raw brass horn, as you can see, this is, this is not shiny at all. But you don't have a lot of the issues down the road, such as the pitting of the instrument happening, because the wear of the metal from your sweat um, just happens um, more evenly over the surface of the instrument. And I generally like the way I've played horns that are lacquered and horns that are um, raw brass back to back. And since lacquer is such a thick coat and the French horn has so much tubing, so it's a lot of lacquer to lacquer French horn. I find that lacquer leads to a distinctly more plasticky sound versus um, raw brass. So that is why in our shop, even though it's harder to maintain, um, whenever we can carry the unlacquered version of a horn, we will carry the unlacquered version of the horn over the lacquered version. Um, I know some people would disagree and would say, hey, you know, I really want a horn that's shiny. I'd prefer the lacquered horn. But that, that is why we choose raw brass, because I frankly think it plays better. Um, silver plate or gold plate, things you see very rarely on horns. And I'm not sure why, because if you notice, most trumpets are silver plated. And in a way, it gives the same benefits of protection, at, well, temporary project, protection as a lacquered instrument without the thick coat, because plating is very, very thin and doesn't affect the horn nearly as much as a coat of lacquer would and a more even um, wear pattern. But I guess tradition, French horn players don't tend to gold or silver plate their instruments. Um, mouthpiece, some, some professional horns you can, you know, I, you'll normally say the mouthpiece that comes with the instrument is just use it as a paperweight. Uh, higher end horns like you know like the Rico Kuhn comes with a a JK a Joseph Clear mouthpiece which is a very decent mouthpiece you know it's not just a paperweight you know it's definitely worth trying and like our Varus horns we uh, send it off with one of our Varus VX mouthpieces which are high quality which are high quality very usable mouthpieces 
Um, in general, the maxim is still true. Um, the mouthpiece that comes with the horn is usually not very good. And cases included. Uh, this is the 871 is probably the most expensive horn you can find that still comes with a case at eight thousand dollars. Here we go. I have a question here. Are there any professional horns you would recommend that have a more colorful and free sound com uh, similar to an Alex 103? So I I'm assuming aside, I'm assuming you don't want me to list off just Alexander 103 copies. Like we have a Dirk D3 in the shop right now, which has a very colorful and, and free sound, but it's wrapped like an Alex 103. It's, um, it's that kind of horn. The Rico Kuhn innovation in the first iteration, in the first configuration I got it in, had a very Alex 103 type sound, which is another reason why I decided to have um, several changes made to the horn, because that, in the places I play and for my personal sound preference, it, I did not want an Alex 103 type sound. But uh, those changes were if you, the Rico Kuhn innovation with the ML3 bell instead of the ML2 bell. My innovation has an ML2 bell now, which is a narrower bell. So the the, the wider bell flare, the ML3, and then the gold brass lead pipe. I had mine changed with nickel silver lead pipe, but that with the gold brass lead pipe. And then the standard tuning slide. Um, my horn does not have the standard tuning slide. Um, and I'm not sure exactly what to call it because I'm not sure Rico Kuhn is advertising the special tuning slide that I have yet. But um, if you get that with the ML3 bell, gold brass lead pipe, and the standard tuning slide, you'll get a very colorful and free sound. And it's very Alex 103-ish. Um, Aside from that, you have um, Engelbert Schmidt's compact tapered horn. So what we normally carry in the shop is the golden cut tapered horn, which is a sound profile um, more marketed in North America. But um, aside from the golden cuts, Schmidt has his compact tapers, which is aimed at the German market. And um, that horn does get a more Alex 103 type sound as well. Uh, so I hope I answered your question there, Tyler. Um, and I should put the camera back on me again. One of these days I'll remember to actually switch. And yeah, so I think that's about it for the spec sheets. I hope this um, this talk has been useful. I know I have an, a tendency to ramble at times, but there's a lot more information here than what meets the eye. And I wanted to spend some time to just talk about it. So I hope this is useful to you. If you're helping yourself, you know, if, if you just need help buying a horn or if you, um, you're getting a horn for your student, or if you just like looking at, at horn spec sheets. Um, you know, I work in the musical instrument industry, so I don't spend a whole lot of free time looking at spec sheets now, but like I look at car specs all the time. You know, I, I can't afford anything more than my Hyundai. <laughs> um, still seeing any more questions? I'm not, not seeing any. Thank you for joining me. Uh, and hopefully it will not be a month and a half before my next stream. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye.